Water Environment Federation. I want to welcome each of you to the joint WEF-WERF webcast, Net Zero Energy, Energy Solutions for Water Resource Recovery Facilities. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. All of the PDF PowerPoint presentations are now available for downloading at WEF's website. This link was included in the GoToWebinar reminder emails an hour before the webcast and will be included in the fall of email sent an hour after the webcast has ended. The reminder email is also included a link for the webcast professional development hour instructions for those eligible to receive these training credits. There are 1.5 PDH credits for this webcast. You will need to complete the evaluation form to receive the PDH certificate. Your feedback on this webcast is important and helps identify future webcast topics that are timely and helpful to you. Please follow the PDH instructions and check with your state accreditation agency on how to receive this credit. During this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will have an opportunity to submit questions by typing your specific question into the GoToWebinar pane that appears on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Computer screen. Today's moderator, Lauren Fillmore, will be accumulating questions and direct them to the presenters throughout the webcast. We will be recording this webcast. A link will be, or, sorry, the webcast recording link will be available on the webcast website within 48 hours after the event. If you have any additional questions after the webcast has ended, please email webcast with an S at WEF.org. Before we get started, I have a poll question for everyone. Let me go ahead and launch that. The question is, how many people are participating in the webcast today at your computer? Um, and the responses are a little bit different than our usual polls, um, so please pay attention to which response you're clicking, uh, one, two, three, four, or five plus. Um, if you're participating in a if by yourself, please respond one. If you're participating in a conference room with a large group of people, if you could do a quick head count, that would be great. All right, we've got a little over, oh, we've got 85% voted, so thank you so much. Go ahead and close that and share the results. It looks like we have 87% participating by themselves today. So I'd like to thank Lauren for moderating today's webcast. Lauren Fillmore is currently a Senior Program Director at WERF. Lauren? Welcome to the WERF WEF webinar, Net Zero Energy Solutions for Water Resource Recovery Facilities. For over five years now, both WEF and my organization, the Water Environment Research Foundation, have supported energy management at water resource recovery facilities. Both of our organizations identified the need for energy research and guidance for water utilities of all sizes to advance sustainable energy management, including increased renewable energy production, as well as energy conservation. While it may not be practical for all to become energy positive or neutral, all of us can take significant steps towards increasing energy sustainability. WERF is in the middle of a five-year research program to advance energy production and recovery. Our goal is to develop new approaches that allow water resource recovery facilities to become energy neutral, meaning able to operate on the energy embedded in the water and waste that they treat. Um, I would like to go on now and introduce our first speakers. Um, these are my researchers, Gustavo K. Roz at Black & Veatch and Ralph Eschborn from AECOM. Gustavo is a process engineer who specializes in the design of mechanical and thermal processes for wastewater treatment facilities and in residuals management. He led the energy modeling project task for the recent project, the Energy Balance and Reduction Opportunities Project. That's the uh, heart of this webinar. Ralph, with over 30 years experience, is AECOM's America's practice lead for water and energy. He specializes in biosolids technology and energy production. He was a task leader also in the WERF project. Gustavo, I'm handing it to you. Okay, good afternoon and uh, good morning, depending on where you're sitting. 
Uh, Ralph and I will be teaming up throughout the presentation, so we'll be switching back and forth through different sections. Just wanted to take a moment to let you know that we appreciate you calling in to hear what we have to say today. And with that, let's get started. So here's our agenda. We'll be hitting on some key concepts in terms of energy neutrality. We'll also discuss the energy recovery potential of U.S. water resource recovery facilities. And in the heart of the presentation, which is uh, an overview of the inner one c 12 project, that's the Net Zero Energy Solutions Project. We'll discuss some energy modeling concepts, some real-world case studies, and then present our key findings. And at the end, we'll open up for questions. So to get us started, I would like to get us on the same page with respect to the definition of energy neutrality. So an energy neutral facility or a treatment plant in our case is one that generates 100% or more of the energy required for its operation solely from the energy embedded on the, on the processed foods that it treats. So in our case, it's waste, the waters and, and the waste, and that would include any imported waste as well. So as an industry or a sector, we're not at energy neutrality, but we are on the road to neutrality. So to get there, we need some metrics, and those metrics uh, would help us gauge on how our our progress is being, how pro progress is being made on this path towards neutrality. Now, most utilities think of energy neutrality from a perspective of electrical energy neutrality, so that's your electrical intensity or consumption, that's your kilowatt hours per million gallon of wastewater treated. That's okay. However, some utilities are starting to take a more holistic approach to this question of neutrality. So if you're a utility, you know that you're not only purchasing electricity from the grid, but you're also consuming natural gas, fuel, oil, and also chemicals. And there, there are embedded energies associated with those chemicals. So if you're looking at energy neutrality from a more holistic approach, then you're, you're really looking at your total site energy neutrality. A third metric is primary energy neutrality. That's a term and a metric that's more commonly used in the energy industry. I will get into a little more detail what primary energy means, but that's another metric to measure neutrality. So. The point is that at 100% neutrality, all these metrics are equivalent. However, on the road to neutrality, these, they are not the same. So we need, as an industry, we need to understand what each of these metrics are telling us. Now, a lot of people have not heard of primary energy. Uh, again, a common term in the energy industry. At a very high level, primary energy is the energy embedded in the raw fuel that is either burned or otherwise converted to useful forms of energy. So that's uh, prior to any transformations or inefficiencies that take place along the way. So in a power plant, you have inefficiencies associated with the conversion. And then you have distribution losses associated with the distrib uh, electrical distribution system. The US EPA Energy Star Sort Site uh, ratios electricity, that's grid purchase electricity at 3.34, and natural gas at approximately 1.05. So what does that mean? That means that for every energy unit of electricity that you use on site, there is an equivalent of 3.34 energy units that's required to produce it and to deliver it. Now the power sector, just like us, they're striving to improve conversion efficiencies, uh, delivery efficiencies, that's uh, through higher conversion, so better technologies, uh, smart grid technologies, for example. So as technology advances and we become more energy efficient, these factors or these, uh, these ratios tend to go down. But for now, that is uh, the current state of affairs, and that's what we have to deal with. So why is it looking at the question of neutrality so important? Well, as a sector, we are a significant portion of the total U.S. energy usage. If we compare ourselves and benchmark ourselves uh, against top power electric users, uh, if we look at water and wastewater combined, we are a total of close to 2%, and that's a higher consumption rate than iron and steel industries, petroleum and refining, plastics. Now out of that, 1.4% is water, and then the wastewater portion is this 0.6%, which is equivalent to this 22.3 terawatt hours per year of electricity, or 270 trillion BTUs per year of primary energy. Now these numbers came from the Utilities of the Future report, which was a companion or sister study to the Enter 1C12, the net zero project we're talking about today. The researchers for that portion of the, of the project looked at the US EPA 2008 Clean Water Shed Needs Survey in terms of process, process and flow information uh, for information collected from POTWs across the United States. And in conjunction with the 
energy modeling that was done for the Inner 1C12 project, this estimate of a total sector energy, wastewater energy consumption was, was taken from that. Now, another resulting goal of this uh, companion study was to characterize the forms of energy that are available in wastewater. And as a result of this study, it was determined that a large majority of about 80% of the energy available in wastewater comes in the form of uh, thermal energy. So that is energy in the form of heat that's in the wastewater and that's recoverable uh, from your raw wastewater collection and conveyance systems, your plant effluent. This is really the next big area of research. Paul Cole will be discussing this in more detail later in the webcast. But typically, in a wastewater treatment plant, there is not enough heat demand to really take advantage of all this thermal energy. So a lot of that demand has to do with outside the fence uh, demand. So that would be potentially any neighboring facilities that could be commercial buildings, residential, and that lies some of the, the barriers associated with uh, distributing some of this energy and extracting. One of it is proximity to the site and also the lack of infrastructure related to, to recovering that. If you think of it as uh, distribution heat pumps, for example, we don't, we're just not, not there. Again, next, uh, next big uh, area of research uh, for energy recovery. The next largest form of energy is chemical at about 20%. So this study and the great majority of the studies uh, prior to this one really concentrated on the recovery of chemical energy as a sector. We have been able to make great strides here, but it's still, there's still a lot of room for improvement. I'll show that in the next slide. The next form of energy, it's kinetic energy that's, very, that's depicted there as hydraulic with less than 1% of the total energy available. And that is uh, very site and location dependent. So, the take home here is that there are, there's plenty of energy embedded in the wastewater, enough to drive the entire industry about five times the amount of energy, and that's equivalent to about 851 trillion BTUs per year. And um, so how do we represent this graphically? So if you're not familiar with the Sankey diagram, the, the line, line thicknesses are directly proportional to the energy associated with that process stream. So as I mentioned earlier, 80% 80, 80 is thermal. So that's the thick orange line there. And then you have your chemical energy in the light blue and hydraulic and the dark dark blue there. Now, everything with the exception of uh, electricity here is measured in terawatt hours per year. And, and everything else is in trillions of BTUs per year. So as we can see here on the top portion of this Sankey diagram, as a result of the Utilities of the Future study, there are 492 per 92 facilities that have the highest potential of achieving energy neutrality. And if we concentrate on those facilities, we have a total potential of generating about 6.1 terawatt hours per year of electricity. That's about a third of the total sector demand. And so it, that's really the low hanging fruit per se when it comes to water resource recovery facilities. So as we more formally transition into the Inner 1C12 project now that we covered some of these background materials. I'd like to put up the, the object, objective of the project was really to develop uh, new approaches to allow wastewater treatment plants to become energy neutral. So that means that these facilities that again operate on the energy that's embedded in the water and the waste that it treats that including your imported waste as well. Now the project was subdivided into four tasks. The Task one was energy modeling. Task two was the real world case studies. And then to gain a wider perspective, we also looked at a triple bottom line evaluation, different biosolids management alternatives. And then task four, which is our deliverables, there will be three separate reports, one for task one, one for task two, and one for task three. So at this stage, I'd like to switch over to Ralph, uh, and he can just, we'll discuss some of our modeling approach. Thank you, Gustavo. I'm uh, bringing up the slide as we speak. So can everyone see the same slide? I'm going to advance now. Uh, we should be looking at a slide titled Energy Modeling Approach. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our methodology here in terms of the, uh, the, the this phase of WORF research. Uh, we wanted to 
uh, cover the waterfront, if you will, of uh, wastewater treatment configurations uh, so that members of the wastewater community could find a facility that was very similar to theirs and use that as a, a, a very relevant reference when they're looking at their own charting of a path down the road to neutrality. Uh, we standardized on a 10 MGD facility large enough that it could uh, be representative of larger facilities uh, and uh, uh, still uh, relevant to a large number, uh, we, we put together 50 baseline energy models. Our methodology involved uh, energy balances, energy and material balances for all of these configurations. Uh, the little diagram on the right is another Sankey diagram uh, that, that uh, uh, was described by Gustavo. This is actually how we portrayed all of our results in terms of looking at a wastewater treatment configuration and being able to first do a mass balance, a rigorous mass balance, and then uh, converting that to energy flows throughout the facility, recycle streams, mainstream, uh, power inputs, uh, uh, heat inputs, and outputs. Uh, so we had uh, 25 uh, of these 50. 25 were uh, a configuration based on typical performance, and we used authoritative sources like Metcalf and Eddie Forth and uh, MOP32 to, uh, to get uh, mid-range values, and then we use those same authoritative sources at the 90 or 95th percentile to get best practices. The idea being here that this phase of worst research is geared to helping the wastewater community come out of the blocks quickly, if you will. They uh, would have the ability to apply well-established practices uh, to improve their energy performance, their energy management, and uh, striving towards uh, net zero. Uh, in, uh, in order to do uh, the rigorous mass balances, we used uh, GPSX. Uh, that's a modeling platform. BioWin is a counterpart. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that. That uh, that uh, enables dealing with all these recycle streams and coming to a uh, a solution uh, of all these simultaneous equations, if you will, that is uh, fully rigorous and balanced. And then we applied eSankey, which is a software program to take the output of uh, GPSX. Uh, and, and as translated into the energy values and convert it into an illustration like you see on right. And uh, the virtue of that is that even though we're down in the weeds uh, to make sure that uh, we've rigorously prepared these mass balances, we like to then come back up so that uh, you can see the overview of what's happening, uh, get a grasp for the whole system and, and where energy is flowing. Uh, we then uh, built upon this work by looking at uh, what we called uh, pioneering process models, these uh, modules. These were uh, uh, processing steps that we would now add on to these uh, wastewater uh, treatment configurations that would have an energy impact. Uh, and uh, the distinction is that in going from typical to best practices, you're taking your flow sheet as it exists and you're employing uh, established methods to improve it. Now we're making process changes. So this would be uh, higher, more capital intensive, but these are opportunities to make uh, more, more uh, significant quantum steps towards uh, net zero or neutrality. Uh, and then uh, in, in a way to take certain configurations and make them all they could be, uh, we, we pyramided the, uh, the individual modules. We had studied them individually to see their individual impact, but now we pulled together all modules that were compatible with a particular configuration and, uh, and pyramided them so that we could see how far that took us towards or beyond neutrality. We call those uh, model facilities. So uh, here is a, an expanded view where we can uh, take a little more time to, to walk through what's happening in, uh, in the uh, uh, process. Uh, and here, uh, we're color-coded. Uh, the blue is uh, the energy embedded in the wastewater retreat, water retreat, uh, the part of our charter. And you see coming in from the left, uh, the uh, these are absolute values, of course, geared to a 10 MGD facility. But you see a big blue arrow coming in, showing uh, the energy embedded and measured as COD in the wastewater coming in. You see uh, uh, a good percentage of it uh, dropping out the bottom as a primary sludge, going to the gravity thickener and going on over to anaerobic digestion. Uh, we have a conversion there to a high quality energy form, biogas, digester gas. Uh, gases uh, are in green. And then uh, going to a combined heat and power facility uh, and uh, making power on site, making heat on site, feeding the heat back to meet process and space heating needs. And so you see that uh, in this case, uh, you're, you're, you're handling about uh, 40, 40 some percent of the 
power requirement of the facility uh, uh, by on-site generation, the rest being imported. And then you can see how energy flows into the various steps, the power flowing into the various steps. Part of our definition did include uh, high, high energy chemicals, so you see hypochlorite here as well, although this particular configuration didn't, you, didn't have much in the way of consumption. So here we're going to take a look at, uh, at the standards we used. Uh, it was very important for this, this hypothetical 10 MGD facility to talk about what standards we were treating to. In many of our cases, uh, uh, reflected going to increasing or more stringent effluent limits, uh, and generally that increased the energy requirement, as you might guess. So we had basic treatment, uh, well, BOD removal uh, to less than 10 milligrams per liter, TSS to less than 15. Then we went to nitrification as an increased level of uh, treatment beyond that to biological nutrient removal and then uh, to a uh, the most stringent standard of enhanced nutrient removal. And you can see there where uh, we, uh, we were uh, dropping ammonia down and then uh, looking at uh, total nitrogen and phosphorus to lower levels. Uh, in getting into these cases, we now had to add another uh, energy intensive chemical, uh, supplemental carbon in order to meet the BNR and ENR limits. And then uh, to get to enhanced uh, nutrient removal ENR, we had to go to tertiary treatment, again, adding more energy. And uh, we also had a, a membrane bioreactor configuration that we, we put in at the BNR level. So uh, just to get a flavor for the kinds of values that we, uh, we set on as uh, inputs uh, based on the review of the literature, uh, the, uh, here, you, here, here you see uh, typical and best practice values that we use for our uh, configurations, our uh, energy and material balances. Uh, a pump, and, and these are major places that impact energy, of course. Uh, we've got uh, uh, energy use and grit removal uh, can vary quite a bit, whether you're using aerated grit removal or uh, centrifugal methods, pump efficiency, uh, primary clarifiers, uh, removal efficiency, fouling in the uh, secondary uh, aeration step, uh, motors and blowers, of course, no surprise there, and then uh, oxygen transfer efficiency, we did not change. We assumed that we were at fine bubble for this, sort of the industry standard now. and. Uh, Gravity thickeners, uh, uh, higher concentration. Of course, higher concentration improves your heat balance around your anaerobic digester, gives you other options for uh, uh, using that heat or avoiding supplemental fuel use. Uh, gravity thickeners, recycle streams, of course, add energy. So uh, removal efficiencies were important there. Also in, uh, in uh, uh, other, other uh, recycle uh, steps. And then uh, uh, I'll, I'll, to move forward, uh, I'll uh, skip some of these, but uh, uh, jumping down to combined heat and power course, the latest generation of, uh, of uh, internal com uh, combustion engines uh, have uh, reached 40 and above in terms of electrical efficiency, so uh, that was considered a best practice. And uh, if there are any questions uh, in the Q&A period, we can come back to this. So uh, just looking at the overall methodology, we had the best practice configurations. We built pioneering modules one at a time to see their impact, and then we went to the model facilities. And uh, uh, the pictures on the right just show gas clean, or on the left, sorry, show gas cleanup and uh, some uh, state-of-the-art micro turbines. So now we'll go through a few results uh, just to, to share with you. Uh, this is a, a summary of uh, by. Uh, uh, by uh, treatment standard of uh, the typical and best practice energy intensity. Uh, here we're defining electrical intensity. Here we're defining that as kilowatt hours per million gallons. So now we've kind of normalized uh, away from the 10 MGD facility and absolute values. And uh, you, uh, you can see that uh, in almost all cases, best practices made substantial uh, reductions uh, in, in going from uh, a given level of intensity. And uh, what you see on the right column is a comparison of uh, how the energy can increase, energy requirement can increase as you go to more stringent treatment standards. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, uh, you're looking at uh, quite a spread. We started as 100% normalized around uh, BOD removal, uh, up to 128 for nitrification. BNR actually lower than nitrification, perhaps somewhat surprising, but here's where you're uh, recovering 
uh, in an anoxic zone, you're recovering the oxygen that you spent a lot of energy to tack on to uh, a, a nitrogen molecule, and uh, we're getting some of it back. So actually a nice finding there. And even when you go to ENR and tertiary treatment, a little less than nitrification alone, it actually uh, ends up uh, being a, a process module to consider to put in uh, uh, anaerobic zones and uh, and uh, denitrify even if you are only looking at a nitrification standard. And then MBRs, uh, sort of energy hogs here, although they had the largest percentage reduction to go to best practice. So uh, 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 lots of opportunity there if you're doing that. And of course, if you're having to do water reuse and you, you need that higher standard, uh, this is where you come out. So now we can uh, look at uh, some of uh, the reference values. This is getting into benchmarking, again, using electrical intensity uh, as a yardstick. And uh, uh, you, uh, we wanted to see how our, our uh, configuration stacked up against various other surveys and, and references. Uh, so we had, uh, as you see, around uh, 18, 1900 kilowatt hours per million gallons for uh, the collection of our BNR configurations. Specifically, configuration G1 was right in, in uh, close to that. And then, if you look at MOP32, uh, their values were similar. Uh, there was a, a well-done Wisconsin study. They came out a little higher, uh, but uh, still in the same ballpark. Uh, the WERF fact sheet. Uh, came out at uh, around that range to quite a bit lower. And uh, part of our study was to uh, partner with uh, a number of utilities uh, that we used for uh, so, uh, as a pool to select our case studies from and also to provide information on pioneering modules. In many cases, these modules were uh, not, uh, not around long enough to have authoritative literature references. And we wanted to be able to look at real world data uh, you know, a demonstrated full-scale facility because all these technologies are supposed to be uh, ready for uh, application as part of that coming out of the blocks. And what you see is that we ended up with a fairly representative pool of utility partners as well, just under 2,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Gustavo. He's going to take us through a few examples. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so to keep this in perspective, I just wanted to reiterate uh, the point of modeling all the facilities. So the idea is that a respective utility can use the report, so that's the tables, the Sankey diagrams, as a catalog of sorts uh, for facilities. And the user will be able to identify which facility was the closest to theirs, and then benchmark their facility in the spectrum of the typical case uh, all the way to the best practice case, and then use the best practice case to trace a path towards neutrality. Now today we'll look at examples, configurations G1 and G1E. So for the naming convention on the Net Zero project, each configuration is represented by a letter and a number. The letter represented the liquid stream treatment and the number, the solids process. So in the case of G1, for example, the one represented the anaerobic digestion and letter G represented the BNR with primary treatment. And the E in the end there is related to the CHP biogas recovery. So for each configuration, again, we looked at both typical best practice cases. Next two slides, we'll look at two Sankey diagrams, one for the G1 and the G1E configuration. So by, as Ralph already mentioned, you know, graphically representing the, the energy distribution in a treatment plan, we're able to more easily visualize where all the energy is going. And that way, we can really identify those in more energy intensive processes and try to and help us make decisions as we target or identify areas that are that have the greatest opportunity for improvement. Again, the line thicknesses are directly proportional to the amount of energy related to that stream. One of the eye openers here for us was acidic acid. Uh, Ralph alluded to that. We actually for intensive chemicals, we included the energy of production. So in effect, we're trying to simulate the energy that we would have to bring to site to produce that, uh, that our own acetic acid. So if you compare the thickness, thickness of the natural gas amount required for acetic acid production with your digestion gas, for example, that's actually uh, quite a bit thicker. And for every, for, for every input of energy, so there are 2.34 times the amount of energy required 
uh, for acidic acid production for that we get in terms of unit of, units of energy in terms of COD that would be used in your BNR secondary treatment. A couple other things we can gain from uh, looking at the Sankey diagrams here, we can see that about 31% or 57,284 megajoules per day remained in the dewater biosolids, 9% of the, of the chemical energy remained in the final effluent, and 33% uh, of, the, of the influent was actually converted in terms of digestion gas. In this case, again, this is the G1, uh, G1E, so we're not, we don't have CHP, so the biogas is either going to flare or to a boiler to provide the heating needs associated with the anaerobic digester. On the case of the G1E configuration, we are producing electricity and able to offset some of those grid purchases, and uh, we are able, based on the G1E, baseline configuration, again, this is a typical case, we're able to produce about 26% of the total site electricity requirements. So if, if you look from a, in terms of neutrality, this facility would be 26% electrically energy neutral. So in the report, there will be tables uh, such as, as these that we're showing for the G1 and G1E baseline configuration. Uh, so a particular user would be able to go in and look at the most energy intensive processes in our case, our biological reactor, as expected. And then also, as you're benchmarking yourselves, you can look at typical performance versus best case performance, and then the projected improvement. So on the total electrical energy usage for each facility, you're able to see that. And you can see what kind of improvement you can actually gain by subscribing to some of these best practices. And one thing that's important to point out here is that we can see that electrical energy neutrality, we're able to improve from 26 to 50 percent. So that's a 93 percent improvement. But then when we compare it to total site energy neutrality, when you're taking into account also the natural gas usage, for example, you're improved from 13 to 19 percent. So not as much as a, as a big improvement. The reason for that was the acidic acid production as we apply to uh, best practices to increase capture of uh, in the primaries and divert some of that energy to anaerobic digestion. Next slide is a just a summary of what we discussed. The highlights are really to look at the improvements between your typical case to your best practice case. And then if you look at the G1E configuration versus best practice, again, electrical energy neutrality, and then your total site energy neutrality going from 26 to 50 percent and 13 to 19 percent, respectively. Now, R Ralph alluded to the, the, the fact that we use this baseline configuration platform to add additional uh, innovative uh, process modules, which we call pioneering modules. There were 18 of those, and those modules were added to the baseline, configura to, to the baseline configurations and based on cutting edge technologies uh, and also technologies that had the greatest potential to improve a configuration's energy balance. So another criteria that we used was also that it had to be uh, modules or technologies that were widely, ex widely accepted and have the interest of the wastewater community. Now next, I'd like to look at two of these pioneering modules, and those were applied to the best practice cases, and both were used as building blocks uh, for the 10 high-performance model facilities that Ralph d mentioned earlier. So the first one is THP. And so thermal hydrolysis, we, can, we did see an uptick on digestion gas production, although the great majority of that was recycled to produce the steam requirements associated with the THP pretreatment module. So there was a little bit of, a, of an improvement in, ter in, ter in terms of electrical energy neutrality, but most of it, again, recycled. One thing to point out here is also the excess heat uh, that is available there, and that's after process and a nominal building heat requirements within the site. So the potential users there would be outside the fence, uh, as we mentioned earlier, for, th for the thermal energy there. So as we know, uh, on a, from a THP standpoint, the greatest benefits are your reduction in solids, uh, improve that, that the waterability, and also the ability to operate at a higher percent solids in your digester. So that frees up some potential vo additional volume there for receiving any imported waste that could potentially improve the energy balance in terms of digestion gas production. And we'll look at that um, here in the next, uh, in the next uh, diagram. But first, let's uh, 
take a look at the highlights, which was increased gas production for the THP pioneering module by 11%. Again, a lot of that recycled back for requirements associated with steam, steam generation for the THP system. There was a redu reduced uh, energy content in the water biosolids, and then uh, improvement all on, on all metrics, which was your energy electrical neutrality, your total site neutrality, as well as your primary energy neutrality. And you can see that 5% on the electrical side, 19 to 21% on the site energy neutrality. And if you remember, we were at 13% on the base case, uh, typical case for the G1 configuration. So it's uh, quite a bit of improvement there. And then also primary energy at 3% uptick. Next, uh, it's your fog digestion. We did see an improvement in digestion gas production about 18%. Uh, there's uh, about double the excess heat available in terms of, uh, of heat. And so as we, as we are to expect with the higher production in digestion gas, we also saw a, an improvement in the electrical site neutrality in terms of reducing that imported grid energy, so offsetting some of those, those uh, electrical purchases. One thing that is important to keep in mind that we did use a typical market availability approach, uh, so that would be for fog that is available on a per capita basis for the modeling. So cities, cities that would have higher concentrations of fog or other organic waste such as food waste could benefit, benefit even farther from the co-digestion co type, uh, type modules or technologies. So from uh, highlights, again, 18% gas production increase. There was uh, an improvement in terms of energy that was still left in the, biosol the water biosolids by 5%. If you remember on the THP side, it actually, the energy, overall energy went down. And then increased ele electrical neutrality to 58%. That's an 8% improvement from your best practice case. And then improvement on the other two metrics of site energy neutrality as well as primary, en primary energy neutrality. So as as we discussed a couple times, we looked at these uh, pioneering modules and used them as building blocks to build uh, 10 model high performance facilities. These facilities would be facilities that would have the highest potential for achieving energy neutrality uh, and that be a, as a result of the best practices. So a couple things to highlight here are that uh, there were three facilities that achieved or went above electrical and primary energy neutrality. Facilities number one, uh, that was your basic secondary treatment. And as you can see, we use THP and fog uh, and food waste co-digestion on all the mod modules that actually utilize uh, anaerobic digestion. And that is because of the synergistic effect associated with the THP freeing up that, freeing up that additional volume to receive some additional, some additional uh, wastes, in this case, higher volatile wastes. The other thing to point out, and Ralph already alluded to this, is that as we move towards more strict nutrient removal, the ability of a facilities to improve the, the energy equation or achieve electrical and primary energy neutrality decreases. So we can see that very clearly when you looked at your basic secondary, your nitrification, and then BNR and ENR. So with that, I'd like to turn it over back to Ralph, where he will discuss some of our case studies. Uh, caught up here. Case studies. So as, uh, as uh, Gustavo mentioned uh, in describing the objectives, uh, in addition to the uh, baseline configurations and, and pioneering modules and model facilities, we also wanted to include some real-world case studies uh, that would uh, show how uh, facilities are actually charting their own path down the road to neutrality as an aid to others. And uh, we, uh, we went to our uh, utility partners uh, for this uh, as a pool. Uh, we had 33 utility partner surveys completed, uh, representing 44 treatment facilities. Uh, and uh, we selected nine of these uh, real-world examples uh, for a case study. Uh, 
Uh, our methodology involved uh, interviews with key staff uh, and then looking at uh, documented technical and financial and organizational, organizational characteristics and what the drivers were. And then we uh, extracted from that uh, uh, the challenges, benefits, and lessons learned. Uh, on the right in the picture there, you see uh, uh, East Bay Mud, one of the poster children uh, for someone that has driven down to, to neutrality and passed. So uh, we started with a survey result, a survey to uh, to uh, characterize this uh, pool of candidates for the case studies. And here you see plotted uh, uh, electrical intensity, uh, megawatt hours per million gallons uh, on the right, and. Uh, you see energy self-sufficiency as a percentage plotted on the left. Uh, and what you see is that uh, we had uh, quite a spectrum in terms of some facilities that were uh, near, near neutrality, near net zero, but quite a few that were very down in a low percentile. And uh, we interpreted that to be that uh, many of the utility partners that wanted to participate in the work study uh, were uh, eager to go down the road to neutrality, uh, but they are uh, their uh, program was still in a very uh, young uh, state, and they uh, had mostly aspirations, but uh, hadn't uh, put their programs in place uh, or their capital improvements that were needed to actually achieve a high energy self-sufficiency. Uh, the other thing that you can get out of this is that you can see that the electrical intensity can vary quite a bit. It doesn't necessarily co correlate. Uh, with the uh, the uh, energy self-sufficiency, and frequently that had to do uh, with uh, uh, aggressive co-digestion programs uh, and uh, power production. So if you generate a lot of power, you still were approaching self-sufficiency even if you had high energy intensity. So uh, this is looking at actual facilities that participated in the study, uh, the shaded area, uh, at the top uh, represent uh, the ones that were uh, near neutral or approaching neutrality. Uh, East Bay Mud, of course, I referenced already as uh, being above 100 percent, although uh, we didn't uh, calculate their index. Uh, but uh, the fact that they're exporting power made that an easy assessment. Uh, and then you see the uh, others that were selected for case study by being uh, on that uh, uh, higher uh, level, uh, closer approach to net zero or near neutrality. Uh, one of the things you can notice, as we already pointed out, is that the uh, actual intensity can vary widely. And also that these aren't uh, uh, all large facilities. Some of them are quite small, and that they made up for their size in part by having a, uh, a uh, aggressive or forward-looking uh, culture and a good champion to drive their program. Some of the things that, that we found common to many of these. So now we'll look at uh, some of the key findings that came out of that. Uh, as I just uh, uh, sort of touched on, uh, uh, the facilities that were further along the road to neutrality exhibited uh, an institutional framework uh, that supported uh, uh, innovation and continual improvement and a long-term commitment to uh, uh, sustainability or energy at zero. Uh, they. Uh, Frequently had already uh, uh, adapted uh, best adopted best practices to minimize their energy use, and some of the, the common elements were the cleaning of diffusers, something that seems mundane, but actually was one of the places where we had a rather seasoned uh, research team, and many of the findings uh, we had anticipated, but this one popped out as a little bit of a surprise that on beyond putting in a good fine bubble system and controlling your diffuser flux and having closed loop DO control, you have to clean them periodically or, or you, uh, you end up with uh, a high energy secondary. And then uh, uh, use of high energy motors operating near design points where possible and maximizing capture and solids processing, a very important point. And, uh, in particular, uh, primary uh, capture and uh, frequently uh, embodying uh, the use of chemically enhanced primary treatment, or CEPT, which has a very nice impact because uh, it's easily retrofitted. And of course, many of these are all existing sites, real world examples, so it's easily retrofitted. And you're diverting energy from secondary that requires power, and you're uh, sending it over to anaerobic digestion in most cases where you can make power. So it's a double bang for your buck. Uh, and then uh, uh, a 
common element in the case studies for those that were uh, near near net zero was the use of uh, co-digestion to enhance their gas production. I touched on this earlier, but uh, the use of anoxic zones uh, was a practice in the case studies to get energy recovery, even if you're only at the nitrification level. And uh, uh, as uh, Gustavo uh, uh, referenced, if you are at the nitrification only or uh, uh, the base level of just uh, BOD removal, uh, you can uh, be you have a, a good uh, starting point to be uh, net energy positive. So uh, looking looking forward, uh, and this is uh, beyond the case studies here. This is uh, findings of the study overall. Uh, Based on how we saw the energy requirements go up for more stringent treatment levels, uh, mainstream shortcut uh, nitrogen removal, mainstream uh, deammonification uh, using Animox bacteria, for example, is going to be required to push energy neutrality beyond that 50 to 60 percent level that we saw for the BNR and ENR facilities. And of course, this is a key subject for continuing WORF research, recognizing this was sort of the the uh, starting phase where we wanted to help people start down the road to neutrality but recognizing that uh, research and new technology is needed uh, as we go into a world of tighter uh, effluent standards. Uh, the other uh, observation is that uh, as uh, Gustavo pointed out in the examples he gave, uh, the dewater biostyle is still retaining a significant portion of the influent chemical energy and that's an, an opportunity to uh, apply further research to see if we can tap that. And then as Gustavo mentioned when he talked about uh, overall the overall energy picture for a wastewater plant, thermal energy is a relatively untapped resource that further research is justified on. So with that, uh, thank you very much for listening to uh, our portion of the, the webinar and I'd like to turn it back to Lauren now uh, to lead the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Ralph, and thank you, Gustavo, too. Uh, to keep us on time, I'm going to just limit this to one question and defer the rest to the end. Um, this is for Ralph. Um, given the fuel sources for the primary energy, can you convert to carbon intensity to gauge the reductions at the water resource uh, reduction recovery facility, uh, so to look at the carbon footprint? So uh, if I understand the question correctly, we're asking about can I use a primary energy standard as, as part of my uh, uh, mass balances uh, and, then, uh, and then apply that from a carbon footprint standpoint? And I think the, the answer is yes, but uh, I'm not sure I was fully responsive. Okay. Um, it may possibly be that because there are different um, sources of the primary energy, different fuel sources from coal to um, you know, maybe natural gas, um, I think the, the question seems to relate to um, does that make a difference in the carbon footprint determinations? Could you track that? Sure, and, uh, and uh, recognize that for our study we used, uh, we used a, uh, a general factor of 3.34 to go for, for, for power, for example, to go to uh, the primary energy required, and, and that's uh, a, uh, an averaging of the efficiencies of, of power plants. And when you go to carbon footprint, you really have to get into, I think as many understand that have worked with it, you have to get into what is your source? Are you, are you nuclear? Are you, are you coal-fired? Uh, and so forth. And that that's going to have a dramatic impact on a, a carbon footprint analysis. Uh, Gustavo, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I'm in agreement, Ralph. Uh, the the 3.34 uh, basically takes into account a fuel mixture within within the U.S. So that includes renewable, coal, uh, natural gas, uh, and ways to to produce electricity. So so yeah, I, I I agree with you in in terms of uh, greenhouse gas as well. Okay, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Cole who's with the City of Philadelphia Water Department, and Paul is the principal investigator of this WERF project. Paul has 20 years of engineering experience, and at the Philadelphia Water Department, he is the energy program manager who is responsible for energy and innovation. So, Paul, I'm turning this over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was very nice. 
Um, and also, it's, it's an honor to participate in this call. I think Gustavo and uh, Ralph are um, some of the smartest people I know. So um, I, I really am honored to be on this call, and I want all of you who are listening to the call or who are listening to the future to this call to, uh, in some sense, know how, I guess, how fortunate you are to have such smart people um, teaching you things. Um, that's also very self-serving, so forgive me for that, but I really think you're pretty special. Um, so uh, my name is Paul Cole, and I'm going to be talking to you about some of the case study work. And also, I'm going to pepper in some uh, natural gas stuff and some thermal stuff at the end. So uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, rel representing the case study for Philadelphia, uh, we're going to use the Northeast plant. Um, give you some information about the Northeast plant. Its average flow is 164 million gallons a day. Its design capacity is 215. Um, we've actually bumped that up to like 235. Um, that's its, you know, dry weather capacity. Uh, its wet weather capacity is 435. We have um, effectively treated up to 500 million gallons of this plant already, um, with future wet weather expansions to go up to 650 million gallons a day. Now, for those who who are familiar with uh, with Philadelphia, we are trying to agree an infrastructure approach. So we're trying to mitigate um, wet weather uh, at its source. Um, trying to prevent uh, water from getting into our systems. But we're also having a gray approach, which is can we, in fact, uh, process high volumes of wet weather so that we don't activate our CSOs. So we're doing a both and approach, and I'm involved in the energy and some of these uh, wet weather capacities. Um, the treatment plant itself uses anywhere from 3 and a half to $5 million worth of electricity, and those are numbers over, the, over history, and the cost of electricity in, um, in our region does fluctuate. Um, our Average daytime um, on peak demand is 8,000 kilowatts. That is on average on you know low flow days it's down to five five and a half and we've gone up to nine nine and a half uh, above ten on certain occasions for um, extreme wet weather conditions. On average we use about 51 and a half million kilowatt hours at this facility. That's just the background. Okay, we built a biogas cogen facility. Um, the engines themselves are dual fuel. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, this and um, we are in a uh, what the US EPA calls a no attainment zone. We are, the city of Philadelphia does not comply with the Clean Air Act. We have too much um, uh, air pollution. And therefore, it was pretty much impossible for us to just build a cogen engine and let it go. So we had to buy and use low NOx engines. Uh, uh, the, the vernacular for that is lean burn engines. So the amount of NOx that's produced during the production of electricity is controlled, and that's done through a sophisticated monitoring of pressures and temperatures. But um, what it means is, is that we've got pretty clean engines. Now, uh, for those of you who know what it's like to live in a no attainment zone, that's not good enough. We have to actually get rid of uh, about 90% of that, too. So we put it through SCRs, which isn't part of this presentation. But um, the air quality was uh, a big part of this design. Um, there, uh, any of you who also uh, design, build, and, and, and necessarily operate uh, these facilities, you'll know that there is a parasitic load. If you're going to have a, a biogas cogen facility, you know, anywhere from 3 to 5% of the energy it produces is used by itself to get um, the uh, electricity made. Another very interesting thing that um, I have found um, about this biogas cogen facility is that these are Yenbacher uh, engines, or Yenbacher 420s. They are designed, they are optimized for biogas. So when we're, when we're running an engine on 100% biogas, I can produce 1.4 megawatts of power. If I don't have enough biogas and I turn off the biogas, or I, for some reason, can't use biogas and I have to use totally natural gas, these engines will run on just natural gas. However, if I put in the same sort of like heating load, I only get 1,240 kilowatts or 1.2 megawatts. They really are. Um, optimized for biogas. Now, where that becomes important is when we talk about the capacity of the engines, 90% biogas, 10% natural gas. So we, we do a blend, and that helps us round out engines. Another important consideration to, to do think about when you're designing these is that uh, anaerobic decomposition of, of uh, your solids uh, produces uh, this biogas. It's, it's a biological process. It has a fluctuation. So we built the natural gas to be able to optimize engine uh, utilization. If I only have enough um, you know, energy to run 90% of one engine, 
I can run that engine, put in 10% more gas, and then I have a full engine's run. The O&M cost of running the engine is the same at you know 50% output, 75% output, and 100% output. Therefore, it's cost effective to inject natural gas into biogas uh, engines to keep them running at optimal levels. I highly recommend it, but it's a but it's an interesting thing that you when you when you design these things for biogas use, you really ought to be running biogas. Um, the good news here in Philadelphia is that already we've built these engines. We're almost we're closing in on the first full year of operation, and already the plant is seeing and thinking about ways to increase increase biogas production. This may seem like a simple logical step, but really that this is how these things work. You know, five years ago our biogas is a liability, and in some sense still is because it's a you know it's a it's a waste that we have to control and make sure we don't just d d discharge into the air. We would violate our air permits. Um, but we were flaring a good bit of it. And now, and then if you were to approach the plant manager five years ago and you were to say, hey, I've got a great idea to produce bio more biogas, he would have looked at you and said, well, <laughs> I'm flaring what I have. You know, why, why would I want more? You know, so now we're, uh, we're pursuing those things. Uh, the other important thing you should know, it is a combined heat and power facility. Therefore, we uh, beneficially use the heat. And uh, we're even looking at plans to to um, increase that utilization of heat. Ta-da! This is what the, one of the, what the engines look like. Um, they are fairly big, and there's no people standing in here, but you can see a drum sort of in the background, so you can get an idea of scale. Um, they're basically big. You know, they sound like locomotive engines because they kind of are locomotive engines, but they they run on biofuel. The capacity of these engines full out is about 85% of our total energy need. Um, and as Ralph and Gustavo went through, um, we can produce this much energy on site, but you have to feed in some of uh, natural gas in order to get to that, that level. Therefore, it's not totally 85%. You know, we're still pushing energy neutrality. And I don't know if I'm going to go into this thing, but there's, you know, we have, we've built four engines. We have room for a fifth. Um, we don't have gas enough for a fifth, but um, you know, if we do uh, pursue the things that Ralph was discussing, the fats, oils, and greases, the more food waste, uh, we're going to do some co-digestion, which I'll talk about later, we might be able to build a fifth engine. But oh, going back, what, what's interesting about alternative energy projects is um, I'm, I'm assuming you can all see me circling this 85%, but as we add more and more energy, we become, we, we, you know, we come into net neutral, but then we start exporting. Because of the size of this facility and uh, the regulations in the PJM market and also the state of Pennsylvania, I can't export energy. So I am regula I'm regulated to, uh, against being able to, to be a net exporter of energy. So when we get to the limit, that becomes very difficult for me to um, cost justify and also organize around. So um, like East Bay Mud, I may have to find an off taker that's like right next to the, right next to the facility. This is what uh, other thing I want to talk about. I'm shifting gears a little bit. As, um, as the energy program manager, I have a lot of fun. I get to do a lot of interesting things. And, um, but I work for an organization whose, whose primary mission is to you know, effectively provide water and wastewater services. You know, we, we collect storm water. We collect wastewater. We, we treat those. We discharge them to receiving bodies. We distribute healthy, safe water. And that is our primary mission. And I've worked for the department for 20 years. So I'm really in, in line with this mission. And I think it's a great social service. It's a great um, uh, trust that has been issued to the water department. And we do it well. But when you come in and you say, listen, I'd really like to do this with this, then someone says, well, how much is that going to cost me? And well, you know, how does that really meet our primary mission? And the answer is almost always a sustainable utility is, in fact, a utility that's capable of, of achieving its primary mission in, a, in the long term. But um, those discussions are always um, extended and, and um, you know, can become what, uh, filled with tension. Um, as the second point says, I often use triple bottom line thought processes. I use triple bottom line um, language, and I, I try to keep people remembering that you know it, a sustainable organization you know it is in in fact um, cognizant of all three of these elements. Within the utility, we use about 274 million kilowatt hour, uh, hours a year of electricity. Um, this really lovely pie graph lets you know that half of our energy spent on the collection, treatment, and distribution of drinking water, and the other half is used on the collection and treatment of that drinking water. Um, 
because the way we compartmentalize our data, it might look a little different, but basically, you know, we, you know, moving water is what we spend most of our energy on, and the, um, that's really where we spend most of our energy, moving water. And in the treatment process, wastewater is, it spends a lot more energy in the treatment than water treatment, as you would imagine. Um, my job is facilitated by this development of a utility-wide strategic energy plan, and it would be uh, remiss of me not to bring it up. The ability to engage in alternative energy development um, it has been given a, a, a venue, has been given a speaking source by actually having a strategic plan. And the other good news is that the Philadelphia Water Department has for years been very interested in energy efficiency, mostly as cost savings, but because we also realize that the, none of these facilities are going away. You know, we don't have to have a two-year payback because the pumping station will be there for the next 50 years. So th that kind of energy um, efficiency has been codified in this in this document, which really helped um, develop an, a, a, uh, an environment of trust and mutual admiration where you, where you can actually honor the people who've been doing things um, energy efficiently for years, and you don't have to seem like the new kid on the block who came in and said, hey, let's do this efficiently, and they they feel undervalued, and that's that's not a simple matter. It's really important to 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 appreciate you know how things are done in departments and in organizations, and to honor those that have been doing it um, and often silently for years. And so I was really uh, glad to have this opportunity to talk about that and with them. Now we have taken um, the utility watch energy plan, which is a fairly thick document, and we've now downgraded it to a or uh, condensed it into a into a slogan. Buy it, use it, make it. Um, and that is how I'm going to be discussing the rest of the way the Philadelphia Water Department approaches energy. Uh, this is a complicated graph. It's a lot of fun. Um, what it shows at the blue line at the top is the, um, the overall consumption of electricity in megawatt hours. Um, the yellow line uh, underneath it, which looks like an area, is um, the maximum of our hedge. So we buy 80% of the energy we're going to use ahead of time. As you can see, for the first year, the actual purchased energy in the green bars. So what we do is we say, we're going to try to get between, I didn't talk about this, the red, red line. The red line is the minimum hedge, which means we have a strategy. We have to buy more than the red line. We have to buy less than the yellow line. And as you can see, we do. Um, the numbers that you really should keep in mind is that we buy 80% of all the electrical energy used that we need uh, the year ahead of it. So the year that I'm in, 80% uh, of my electrical energy has already been purchased. Two years out, I'm buying 50% of the energy I need. And three years out, I'm buying 25% of the energy I need. The, the reason for that is it's a, it's a hedge uh, fund. You, know, you, um, you, know, you, you, you can control the budget certainty by buying uh, portions of your energy. What this requires is that we actually engage in long-term energy purchasing. Uh, it's been very effective. How do we use energy? Um, this graph, which is more complicated than it needs to be, but I really like more detail in, um, in charts. And if, um, if my staff were here, they would be laughing because I always want more information on charts than less. The bottom green line is the city's overall, GF is general fund, the city's overall energy use profile. The red dotted line is the water department's line. What's interesting is if you take the two and you add them together, you get a straight line. When you add two um, demand response curves, or not demand response, but two demand curves, they come to a line, a straight line. Power plants love to have us as, as a client. They will bid, they will um, give us very good pricing all day long, simply because if I can buy the same number of kilowatt hours all around the clock, then they don't have to change anything. So we, we end up buying, becoming a very good energy purchaser. So. The combination of the city general fund and our fund, and which is not shown here is the airport, which itself is linear, it just goes straight across, um, we become a very uh, good energy buyer. Um, the PICO and NERC things have to do with on-peak and off-peak. And uh, the PICO one here, and PICO stands for uh, you know Pennsylvania Energy uh, actually a Company, that um, Philadelphia Energy Company actually, but it's, a, it's the energy distribution company, and uh, this is how we operate our plants. And you can see our demand. Our demand goes down to when we're on-peak, stays flat, and then once we're off peak, it goes back up. So you can see the, uh, the wings of our demand. And that um, is primarily the job of load control, who pumps all the water through the city. So come you know 8 o'clock at night, they turn all their pumps on, and they fill all the reservoirs. They fill all the storage tanks. They fill everything. At uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, they start ro ro uh, rolling, back, rolling back, and we, we pump the minimum amount of uh, water we can during the day. Now here are sort of the highlights or the fun part of the, of the presentation. I'm going to start talking about the various projects we have. Um, 
we have aircraft de-icing fluid. This is an actual photograph from the, from the Philadelphia airport. This is a US Air's plane being de-iced with um, these cranes. So uh, the Philadelphia also is subject to a weather phenomenon called wintry mix. And the necessity of uh, de-icing planes in the city of Philadelphia is, is large. So they have a special area in the tarmac where they just spray the ADF onto the planes, roll them out, let them, let them um, take off. And they collect all that into large storage tanks. Now, traditionally or historically, that, that, that waste cannot be discharged to the river. It's against the law. Um, it w could be discharged to the sewers. But we charge them an, 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 an inordinate amount of money to have them discharged to the sewers. We charge them so much money that they thought it was more cost effective to put it into trucks and to truck it to different states to have those states process that ADF, um, which was the case. Uh, because the, the, the rates at which we charged were, were high, because we had to put so much energy back into the water to decompose this um, aircraft de-icing fluid aer aerobically. However, we, we actually looked into some ways to actually be more cost effective. And we looked at that ADF. And if we can take that directly into the plant and put it into the anaerobic digesters, which was shown by Ralph and Gustav as a, you know, a good uh, co-digestion source, that we could um, shortcut all that energy, intensive energy and actually make some uh, make some methane gas out of it. So we've been doing that for about five years now, and it has been very effective. Um, it's, it's really just fantastic. They pay us you know, a couple hundred dollars a truck. They are so happy. They're next to our plant. We're producing um, usable methane. Everyone is uh, everyone's, it's a win-win situation. Um, the next is the solar project. I will just briefly touch on that. Solar was excluded from all of this uh, WERF, ENER, 1C12 work, simply because uh, it's like an externality. So um, if you have space, you make uh, room for it, you put in solar, you can make, you can make electricity and use it on, on, your, uh, on your site. Uh, solar is a real technology. It makes sense, and you should use it. But um, it has nothing to do with the wastewater. And so therefore, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of an add-on that we didn't look at in this, in this project. And it's, but it's worth consideration. Now this, I'm going to spend some time talking about this. This is a, a sewage geothermal uh, heat pump. It was a pilot demonstration scale. It was uh, supplied to us from a grant and a vendor called Nova Thermal. On your left, in the picture, you'll see what is known as a sewage rejection pump. So, you, so sewage is pumped into there. And uh, if there's any solids or there's any debris that would foul a uh, heat exchanger, it is rejected and sent back out. And the water that passes through um, in this picture, you can't read it, but they call it gray water. But, we're, but we don't like that term gray water because that's not really what gray water means. Gray water is plant effluent that's used to you know, do various things in the you know, uh, agricultural and or you know, um, lawn and care service kind of industry. But it's, it's water that's no longer sewage with uh, sewage stuff in it, but it's still basically sewage water. So it goes into this unit to the right, and that is a heat exchanger heat pump. And if you look at it, you can see that there's two caps missing. And those two caps missing are, in fact, the dirty water side. What this simply does is that you can pump relatively warm water in and pull uh, even more heat out of it. You do it by running an air conditioner backwards. And that's a heat pump. And this particular facility that you're seeing has um, almost a million BT uh, used per hour. And it has a capacity of 60 tons. Now I'm going to talk more about the, the future of this 80%. We are also, this is a digression, but we're also monitoring the actual temperature in the sewers, uh, in several of the sewers here in Philadelphia. And there is some base loading, which makes this, um, with the distributed heat in those systems, um, available for recovery through heat pumps. That's very exciting. I was just at a presentation this morning, and I heard many sort of uh, industry leaders speak. And one of them was the Environmental Defense Fund. But GE and Apache and um, DOE and EPA were all there. When we talk about heat and heat recovery and energy and primary energy and carbon footprint, I really like that we're talking about carbon and carbon footprint. As our fuel mix goes from less coal to more natural gas, our carbon footprint drops. It, let's say, what is it, 50%, you know, that, that, um, that natural gas produces less uh, carbon for the amount of energy it produces. However, uh, methane gas itself is a greenhouse gas. It is a powerful greenhouse gas. 
So the more we use what the DOE uh, or you know, the, the DOE, the Secretary of the Department, um, says is the key bridge fuel till we get to the next actual sustainable solution, is that natural gas is a wonderful bridge fuel, but that's not the end all be all. We actually do have to move to the next. And this kind of work that we're talking about is you know, sustainability, is natural, is reoccurring, and um, thermal recovery is, is part of that. If 3% of the natural gas we develop and distribute gets launched into the, to the air, you know, the 50% the carbon savings that we're getting out of changing our, our fuel is gone. You know, we don't yet talk about that yet. So it's really important that we continue to keep our eyes on the prize and that we actually recover and reuse as much of our, um, our waste as we can. So that was sort of a uh, political grandstanding there, so forgive that. Future projects. This is a wonderful sort of flow diagram of a um, the southwest uh, facility. The airport, you can see, has this little truck. That's our aircraft deicing fluid. We could also develop a food waste uh, receiving facility, and that could go in into the digesters. And then that produces biogas, which we know. But it turns out that a utility like us has to think, well, what is the best use of our biogas? The, if you go down to the bottom left, combined heat and power is what we did in Northeast, which makes a lot of sense to us. You know, that's a, that's a good project, but it costs money. Purifying this biogas is a very inexpensive, but then what do you do with that? And if you follow the dotted line up to BRC, that stands for the Biosolids Recycling Center. It's a um, partnership. Uh, it's called the Philadelphia Biosolids Partnership, but it's a Cinegro facility. They pelletize the waste here in the city of Philadelphia. We use biogas to help the dryers, the Android's dryers. Uh, right now, we're allowed to take up to 50% of that gas. However, because of the way that the gas systems and the burning schedules work, we have yet to be able to realize that 50%. So if we could increase the value of our gas, the BTU content of our gas, we could burn more of it. Um, so this is a relatively low cost process, and the utilization would be to offset the purchase of natural gas. Therefore, the value of that project is directly proportional to the market value of natural gas. Back over to biogas to the left. The value of that biogas is the value of the electricity in the electric market and the green market for tier one credits for renewable energy development. However, over to the right, the compressed natural gas or the com compressed natural biogas, the market for compressed natural biogas is, is, is uh, very high. It has the highest amount of return on investment that we can get. Um, so what? how does the department make decisions on this? We're actually going through an iterative multi-criteria decision analysis process to help us discern the course. What is the best use of our biogas? I'm digressing again to talk about food, food waste. The largest single identifiable material that gets put in our landfills is food waste. We produce 35 million tons of food waste a year, and 34 million tons of it ends up in landfills or incinerators. And that's a real problem. Um, we have uh, pursued a uh, food waste pro process here, a pilot project in the city of Philadelphia, where we uh, installed food waste grinders in homes to help increase the addition of food waste to the waste stream, therefore increasing the COD. If you think about the, the Sankeys that you were shown, that light blue line would get thicker. And as you improve your primary sedimentation, you remove the food in that step, and you would get more gas and energy out of the recovery process. That's a really fabulous process. Down here to the right is the food pyramid. Um, the US EPA and the USDA, both want, both these federal agencies really want you to buy less food. And if you have extra food, feed hungry people. And if you can't feed people, feed animals. And then you've got this industrial use, which is what I would say we, where the uh, food waste grinders and the, and the, um, the uh, co-digestion comes in. And then after that, composting for fuel additives. Of course, the last thing you should do is add it to um, the landfill. Um, for us, the scale for our current facilities would be 100 to 150 wet tons per day. And that's what we could take as now. Um, that's not even increasing our solids capacity. So that's, that's a... Um, We'd have to do some stuff, obviously, to take that. But that gives the scale of food waste we have here in Philadelphia. Um, there's a lot of things to consider if you're considering this. The liquid fuel um, slurry is preferred for us because we don't have to do the handling, and that's a business model uh, decision to make. The composition of the digester gas can change, as well as your centrate. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to certain food waste, adding food waste to your interior stream. Um, but you really do need to pay attention to, to how it changes things. And um, it produces more biogas. The biogas has value. But it is important to know that um, biogas does not 
depends on how you value the biogas, does not always offset the actual cost of sand handling the solids. Uh, future projects, this is the Fairmont Waterworks Interpretive Center. Um, we're hoping to install a sewage geothermal um, pump there as well so that we can heat and cool this facility using a sewer. Now, that's the art museum, and this is Fairmount Waterworks Interpretive Center, and the sewer runs back by here but between these two facilities, and we believe we can heat and cool those. Same thing with the airport. This is the Southwest facility, and it's just we put our logo over it. These are the three heating facilities. Um, actually, there's one, two, three, and we believe this will be the fourth. We believe we can do a sewage geothermal um, heat exchanger process, and we could heat and cool the airport. The graph down here shows that um, this is the average southwest sewage heating potential, and that's just, uh, I believe, a degree uh, per gallon. And this is um, millions of BTUs. So it's 50,000 million BTUs. Uh, and or between 40,000 million BTUs and 50,000 um, is our capacity. And this is the minimum flow it would have. And this is the actual natural gas use profile for the art museum. So this is a one degree drop in the flow. And this is, it, it's, you know, that already exceeds the need for the airport. So we think we have enough heat in our sewage to be able to uh, heat and cool the airport. We're also considering more solar. This, I believe, is 14 acres. And it's a reservoir. It's covered storage. Why not consider you um, solar there? We throw this in because one of the things that we found as a team is that um, these turbines produce less than one percent of the electrical demand during game day, but that that produces more than ninety percent of their public interest in renewable energy. This is the Lincoln Financial Field, the home of the Eagles. These are solar panels. And uh, down here, same solar panel things. Um, what I want to encourage you is that don't underestimate the value of bling. Public visibility, public engagement. These turbines, um, you know, are not bad. They're fabulous. They produce electricity. But you know, relative to carbon footprint reduction, relative to effect of the actual operation, they're almost insignificant. Yet, they have helped the Eagles brand themselves as a truly green facility. And believe you me, green is not wasted on the on the, on the Eagles. I'll skip over this. This was hydrokinetic. We did an analysis. It didn't wasn't cost effective for where we could use it, and then we looked at how much the uh, electricity would have to cost before they would become cost effective. And we do that kind of stuff um, as an energy team, so we can keep these things in our book back back pockets. Um, continued money matters. Um, everyone on the phone knows that money matters in the. Uh, case study that, that is Philadelphia, we had Act 129 funding. That's a Pennsylvania State Act. Um, we get money for the Smart Ideas program. We also sell the electricity on something called a GATS, which is a General Attribute Tracking System, which is an alternative energy portfolio standards system. So we actually sell the value, the green attribute of our green energy we make. And um, there are other smaller energy programs that are paid in the federal incentives. We had to do a public-private partnership to avail ourselves of tax advantages that were around, um, which is important. When I say money matters, and down here it says shop your ideas around, you never know where this is going to come from. You never know who might have money to incentivize the thing you're doing. Um, close to last slide, uh, triple bottom line. Almost everyone knows this. However, I have met people that have never heard of triple bottom line, so I guess it's safe. It's, I would say it's safe to assume everyone knows about this, but you, you never know. Um, so the triple bottom line is very important, the, you know, social, financial, environmental. The CHP project in Philadelphia is a wonderful environmental project. It makes sense. It ultimately is cost effective, but you have to look at a 20-year life cycle. And when I say cost effective, it is cost effective, but you know, the, but the uncertainty is fairly high, and there's a possibility that it could or could not be cost effective, depending on what the market does in the future. However, um, as an environmental uh, initiative, it was fabulous. We turned the flares off. You know, we are reclaiming this energy as opposed to just burning a flare in the night sky. We're now producing energy. Um, social benefits. Uh, people really like that their that their utilities are engaging in sustainable development and they're becoming more net net, net neutral. Um, these are good things, but on the financial analysis alone, the combined heat and power plant at the city of Philadelphia is not a uh, is not a no brainer. And I was you could use Washington as an example. They're down doing uh, thermal the THP. Um, th their story is that you know they they tried to, to 
build digesters to handle their solids, but the cost of the digesters ended up being double the amount that they were, were even on the outside willing to pay. I mean, it became so cost prohibitive, they just had to say no, and they moved to a new idea. Now, this new idea is, is, is less than half the cost of the digesters alone, and so it really makes financial sense. But if they were not required to, or if they didn't have this problem of handling the solids, they wouldn't have just said, oh, let's do a THP project because it makes sense. You know, these are very big projects. They take lots of money. You have to be, you always have to couch projects like this in the reality that you're in, that, you know, that's what is sustainable, what is long term, how do I meet my primary mission, because these things cost money and they're not like cash cows. It's not like someone came up with an idea and these all make tons of money and why, why haven't we been doing it all along, because they're still expensive, but they make sense. Um, my last line says, financial accountability is larger than one metric, so you can't just use bottom line. Um, Ralph and Gustavo already talked about this. You'll need a champion. Um, get connected to academic institutions. And here I'm also going to plug this, this report. I work with Drexel University, and um, I often help senior design students. And this WERF report and uh, things like that are very valuable to students and the engineers that we're producing uh, now who will take us into the future. Getting these ideas, these models, these possibilities into the hands of young um, emerging professionals is a really fantastic thing that we're doing. Um, and as utility people, I think you should get connected to those people, get connected to those institutions, get connected to universities and their research students, their professors, or their uh, co-ops. Um, I sort of alluded to this, but be prepared for opportunity. We do a lot of homework here in the energy team, so when someone says, how about this, we have some idea of whether we can plug it in or not. Um, that takes all forms of things, like looking at cost benefit matrix, looking for grant opportunities, and um, just having like sort of open forums where you brainstorm. And uh, that's it for me, and I think I did all right. I think I got, oh, I went a little over. Thank you very much. Th thank, thank you, you very much, Paul. Um, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, but before I go to the questions, I just want to mentioned that um, WERF is going to be producing three reports as a result of this project. And the first report, which is on the triple bottom line evaluation that we did, will be available this year. The other two reports will be available in early 2015. And I suggest that a lot of the questions may be answered in the reports, and that would be the best way to get the answers. In the meantime, let me start with um, one of the questions. Um, this is for Paul. What was the payback on the turbines at the Eagle Stadium? Oh, well, actually, that, that's, a, that's, an, that's an excellent question, and the, the, there is no payback on the turbines at the Eagle Stadium. They, they don't pay for themselves. The Eagles uh, did uh, used a, the ESCO sort of thought process or the ESCO technique, where what they said was, we're going to do all these energy programs, and we're going to wrap them all up into one. We're going to come up with one big number for all the projects, and the payback has to be um, uh, advantageous. And, and it was. But each individual project may or may not have passed that the muster. And they did it, like I said, primarily because they wanted to get more bling out there, and they were right. Um, those turbines have paid for themselves in PR far more than they've paid for themselves uh, as energy savers. So I'm, I'm extending the question, but really, they don't pay for themselves um, as themselves. OK, thanks. Uh, Paul, another question. Are you receiving any revenue from carbon credits? And if so, what are they? Uh, the answer is yes and no. We receive carbon credits through an alternative energy portfolio, which is a local Pennsylvania state law that requires uh, the product that the energy distribution companies to buy a certain portion of um, green energy, and we can participate as being a supplier to that market. So the answer is yes, and I don't know the numbers, but I believe we pay, we are, we get paid $20 a megawatt hour or something like that for a, for a, a green credit from the, from that. And we also participate in something called the SREC market, which is solar renewable energy market, and that also is a green attribute. Now where I say no is I was at this very exciting meeting this morning, and there still is not yet a carbon tax. And that is a federal issue that is still being bounced around, and not you know there's a there there is a lot of um, heated debate about it and heated feelings about it. But there um, that market when that market emerges, I think that would really help our industry tremendously. Okay, um, 
Another question, Paul, what are the costs associated with accepting food waste uh, at your Philly plant? We don't yet have food waste accepting. We do co digest with aircraft deicing fluid. We are considering food waste, and we do not yet have a program in place. Do you have the, uh, a, a cost estimate for looking at the aircraft deicing fluids? Oh, yeah, no. It's, I, I believe it's like $300 or $350 a truck, and that's, I think, 5,000 gallons or, or 7,000 gallons of ADF. It's okay. pretty inexpensive. The reason it's inexpensive is because it's a liquid that doesn't have, it does not have solids, and we believe it basically, you know, it's, it's a small flow. It converts almost completely. It, it, it dehydrolyzes almost completely in the anaerobic decomposition, so we don't have cell mass. But cost, you know, cost factors, if you had mass, you have, to, you have to figure out how much it costs you to handle those solids. And then for us, we, we have a contract to dry our biosolids. We have, you know, whatever that number is, we have to pay that in our biosolids. So that's, those are real hard costs. Um, okay, um, we're down to the last few minutes. Um, I'm, all the questions that we have now coming in seem to be directed to you, Paul. Um, what is the value of your triple bottom line variables when you're evaluating return on investment for the project? Or how do you um, monetize them, I think, is what the question is getting at. Well, that, that's an excellent question, and I think, uh, Lauren, I think you were right when you said you should read the report to get to answer your questions, because you will need to read the TBL report to, to truly get that. Um, we here in the city of Philadelphia monetize as much as we can, um, and we spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, I heard something this morning about the, um, the uh, social um, license. To, to, uh, for energy developers, you know, the fact that they do development in your state or in your neighborhood, they basically have a uh, social equity that, that they have a license to operate. If they, if they mess that up, you basically tell them they can't operate. And people that produce energy um, can monetize that. And so you, there's lots of ways to monetize everything. Um, the more you monetize things, the easier it is to do a triple bottom line. But um, I also participate and practice multi-criteria decision analysis. And in that way, not everything is monetized, but everything is sort of, um, uh, you have a discussion and you evaluate what the main reasons you make decisions. And as long as you can achieve a, a, a clarity of why you're making decisions, and then you can evaluate different options within that paradigm, you can, you can come to your conclusion. And we do that generally numerically, you know, scaling. Okay, that was the last question that we have time for. I want to thank all of our speakers, um, Gustavo, Ralph, and Paul, and thank you all for um, joining us in this webinar. Again, please look on the WERF website for our reports when they come out. I think this will answer a lot of the remaining questions. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>